everyone, I'm Jana. And I'm Carol. And this is the Real Talk Recreation Therapy Podcast. On this podcast, we talk about real experiences and real research that back up the use of recreation therapy as a method of treatment for a variety of populations. We try to keep it real as we address concerns and successes that we and other recreation therapists have had as we all navigate this awesome career field. We don't have it all figured out, but one thing we know for sure is everything gets a lot easier when you can talk it out with a friend. So, Jana, tell us about the topic that we're doing today. I'm super excited. We're talking about table games today. Table so, games? What are those? <laughs> <laughs> or board games. Some people. So, <laughs> so, I was talking to one of my friends that is not a recreation therapist and telling her about this podcast because, you know, we got to get someone to listen to it. And uh, telling her that we were researching board games, table games, games that you play around at a table sitting down. And she was surprised that it counted as recreation therapy. And I realized it's probably because I talk about the big things we do a lot of the times when I'm talking to my friends. Oh, we went on this big trip or we did this sports competition or something. But (laughs) I felt a little bad. that I misrepresented our profession. It was kind of like those memes, you know, like what my mom thinks Mm -hmm. I do, what my friends think I do. I felt a little bad because uh, to me, table games is something that is much more common, much more like many, many recreation therapists use Mm -hmm. table board games in treatment. That's true. Yeah. Or you have the opposite side of that spectrum where people just assume you only play bingo and that's the only game that you use for your rec therapy. Yeah, it's so true. So (laughs) today we're going to talk about games other than bingo that you can play with people and talk about, you know, why, why table games and board games is really a great option for recreation therapists. So yeah, I guess let's start with why, why did we, why, why should you play table games? Well, I think a huge reason why you should play table games, not only are they very fun, which is a huge part of recreational therapy, but more so there's a lot of value in treatment using this as a modality. So we're going to talk today about some of the benefits of using table games as a modality for recreation therapy. And I'm going to start it out by just talking about some of the populations that we've used it with or that we could use it with. So when I think of table games, I think of the year that I spent working in a memory care facility in Honolulu. I would often use table games as a way to keep my residents cognitively engaged because if you think about it, board games, card games, they all have a lot of cognitive elements. You have to think about what you're going to do, think through your strategy, and even at their most basic, it's very cognitive. So one of the ways that I tried to keep my residents cognitively engaged was playing the game Blackjack 21. Blackjack, try to beat the dealer without going over 21. You want to have be the first one to get the closest to 21 without going over. And so the reason I liked playing this game with my nursing home residents was A, for some reason, people in Hawaii love Vegas. So a lot of my residents had all these like fond memories of going to the casino in Vegas, playing blackjack. It was a very familiar game and it helped them work on the cognitive skill of just basic addition as well as paying attention. So like, it's your turn would you like a card? Do you want to hit or do you want to stay? Like just having to track through with a group of people and pay attention and be like, is it their turn? Now it's my turn. And just like following patterns. We also used other really basic table games like Go Fish, Scrabble, and different memory games to work on those very basic cognitive skills. And so when we were doing research about this podcast, I was excited to find that there actually was some research to back up that table games do have a cognitive benefit with at least the geriatric population. So there was a study that was published in 2021, which is about a longitudinal study about elderly people and the people that were more engaged in different life activities, which included board games, found that those people were able to delay the onset of dementia by up to five years, which is a good amount of time. Yeah, I was super impressed with that study. I was like, this is amazing. And I think they specifically mentioned activity like engagement and activities such as board games so mm-hmm. I thought that was really really cool too and that's awesome that you guys played blackjack 21 that's such a thing that yeah. everyone 
one in Hawaii <laughs> wants to go to Vegas. And so you're doing two things at once, right? Like you've got the cognitive, but also that like remembering thing, which I guess is also cognitive. I worked with TBI and we played slapjack for kind of the same thing things like increased processing speed, attention, concentration, all of those things can help with that population as well. Yeah, it's just cool to think about like when you break down board games, like at their very basic, there's a lot of cognitive skills being used. So if you can identify what those skills are, it's easy to kind of include that into your treatment plan when you're like, all right, I recognize that matching these colors is going to help with this cognitive skill. So you can maybe plan that into your into your day, day to day. Yeah, totally. It totally, it's so helpful that way. And like you said, really easy. There was so much research that we will include in our show notes. Oh, cognitive, you're, you're remembering, you're increasing your processing speed, you're paying better attention, concentrating all of those things, even for some people, right. Even being able to, like you said, follow from one scenario to the next one person's turn to the next is a huge cognitive thing. What's another population that you've used table games with, Jana? So have you ever played the game Curses? I have not, actually. I've played a lot of board games. What is the game Curses? Okay. So this is behavior modification is a really, uh, this 2019 study said it's by board games. <laughs> games in general by design are great for behavior modification and it totally makes sense because when you think about it um board game board games you have a stimulus right you have a task that you have to do and then you do the task so you know you draw the card and then you decide am I going to skip someone am I going to reverse what, what am I going to do and then you get feedback on that based on you know uh, I'm losing my cards. I'm getting closer to winning that kind of thing. So it's very, very obvious behavior modification curses kind of takes that to the next level. So <laughs> curses is this party game where you, you have challenge cards and curse cards. So you draw a challenge card and you, it could be, they're usually like funny things like convince the person next to you why peanut butter and jelly is the best sandwich in the world or act out a role or tell a story. But the thing that makes it complicated is that if you do your challenge, after you do your challenge, you draw a curse card. And these are also silly things like talk like a pirate or you have to spend the rest of the game with your elbows not bent (laughs) or things like that. So then you'll curse someone else. So say we're playing and I do my challenge and then I curse Carol to talk like a pirate. (laughs) So then when you do your challenge, you have to then talk like a pirate and you might get another one that says you have to try and take, if the person next to you draws a card, you have to try and take it from them. So you have to start like remembering all of these things. I did this with teens in a residential treatment center. A lot of times they were working on behavior modification or rules and consequences and understanding those consequences was a big part of those treatment facilities that I worked in. And So this was kind of like an in your face, (laughs) like it's a very like abrupt, like if I do this, then so if say like Carol forgets to talk like a pirate, then anyone can ring the bell and say, Carol didn't talk like a pirate. And then you have to turn your curse over. And if you turn three over, then you're out. So it's an elimination game. The last, you know, the last person standing. A lot of times I wouldn't go to the last person standing. We just go for an amount of time Mm -hmm. because kids can be quite motivated to follow rules when they want to but <laughs> but then we could like talk about it and process it a little bit because yeah it's it's a more fun way to talk about following rules and the consequences than mm-hmm. when you're talking about having to fold your clothes or things like that so it's a really yeah. easy to like pull the teens into this like fun silly game and then talk about things that they were dealing with Yeah, I feel like games provide a really easy way to kind of like bridge those conversations about more difficult topics or maybe more topics that are less fun to talk about. Like if you sat down with a group of teenagers and you're like, all right, we're going to talk about consequences of our actions, like maybe they'd be into it, but (laughs) it might be a little bit more enjoyable if you start with a game and then kind of ease them into it. And then you're able to like kind of generalize what they learned in that game to (laughs) their real life. Totally. Yeah. If, if you can get them in my experience, if I could get them to laugh, then we were going to have way 
way better conversations than, or, or experience anything. I mean, it doesn't have to all be, you know, laughing, but like, if you can get them engaged in that, we, we had way better conversations and it was easier to talk about how it's frustrating to follow a curse versus a rule at the treatment facility, but then able to, you know, branch it over and talk yeah, about frustrations with that or like what's working with that. What do you do to remember that kind of thing? And I, I don't feel like we can talk about behavior modification without talking about individuals with developmental disabilities, because no. that is so much of what the recreation therapists I know that work with individuals, children and adults with autism and or uh, other developmental disabilities are working on this kind of helping teach appropriate yeah. <laughs> I guess. yeah so how do you do that with those populations yeah right and and it's a really and and even with kids I think there's so much research right about how it's so much easier like you were just saying it's so much easier to teach a child something when it starts with a game or a story than being like okay we have to take turns now so yeah. I work with some elementary school kids and one of them with autism and just we played very simple games like nothing like uno like something that you know cognitively was okay for them little shoots and ladders anything but just practicing like waiting your turn and now it's their turn and now it's their turn and paying attention I used those same cues when we were out in the community as well so if we're waiting in line at the library it's like no now it's their turn now it's their turn and so it was yes. it was I guess like a transfer of of training goal right so it was like we're, we're gonna play this game here to learn the skill and then when we're out in the community because we've played this game so often and you're used to it's okay if I wait if I wait just a little longer then it will be my turn yeah it, you know, just like you played Uno. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like it's her turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that's awesome. I don't usually think about table games as a modality to work on physical skills, but that's because I'm like thinking too big, right? Gross okay. motor skills. If you reframe and start thinking about fine motor skills, it's it becomes a great tool. To yeah, definitely. On. So that brings me back to my nursing home residents, many of whom have just decreasing motor skills. Like for a lot of older adults, it gets harder and harder for them to pick up smaller items, to move small items. So to be able to use table games, it was a good way to continue to practice those skills of like pinching, grasping, even like reaching across the table. All these things that are useful when you're eating, when you're doing other things, other activities of daily living, you can practice them using games. So I would do things like playing the game Mancala, which I don't know if you're familiar, but it has all those little cups along a board and you pick up pebbles and you drop one pebble in each cup until you're out of pebbles. And then if there's pebbles in the cup, you pick that up and keep going. That is an excellent game to just continue to work on those like fine motor skills of like grasping and then like dropping just one pebble. And then we would play board games like Life or Scrabble. All these things allowed my residents to practice their fine motor skills. And actually, there was a study from 1993 that kind of talked about this, how there are physical fine motor benefits of board games. And it's exactly what I was talking about, just having to physically pick up smaller items, move them, manipulate them, all things that can be done with these table games. Yeah, that's great. I, yeah, I can totally just imagine like trying to, like that you get to a point where things like Mancala is super difficult to like pick it up and mm -hmm. drop just one in like you're working on so many skills there it's super great but hopefully it's still fun yeah yeah <laughs> it's totally. more engaging for nursing home residents than just like having them pick up one item and which sometimes we did sorting but I think if they were at the cognitive level to play a game they kind of practice those fine motor skills without having to be told we're practicing fine motor skills or like to think about it which is nice <laughs> it's a it's an easy way to bring in the therapy without the the feelings that sometimes come with okay here we go practicing this again <laughs> we played wacky six which is a fast-paced card game where you don't have a turn you're just trying to get rid of cards so there is a lot of visual scanning going on like okay I have a five but I'm also like you're looking at a bunch of different cards a bunch of different your own cards and then the cards in the middle of the table that are building 
up stacks. It's really fast paced, really fun. Cause you're like, oh, I have to get my five down before this other person does. And just the first person to, to get it out wins and get rid of their cards wins. And that was, that was great for, so I worked with individuals with minor TBIs and concussions. Okay. I don't know if it would be, I mean, you'd have to assess your population, mostly a, a post-concussion syndrome clinic, okay. uh, but they, they, there were other things, but I would say pretty, I, they, there was definitely like some severe symptoms, but high enough mm-hmm. functioning that this was going to be fun and not, you know, with some TBI, this would be very, you know, overwhelming and stuff. So obviously assess your population, but it was really fun working with this population doing that because it was, it was the same stuff that they were working on with the other therapists at this clinic, but in a different format and a different, and a game that they could take home and play. I had a couple of clients say, oh, I'm going to get this game. Like I can play this with my family. Like I can work Mm -hmm. on this which was a really great thing at that clinic because they do that it was like a week-long treatment and they do incredible things during that week and then you want to have them continue doing skills but like everything doing homework (laughs) no one yeah but at least this homework is fun (laughs) gotta go do my therapy but if you're like hey I'm gonna teach my family this like fun game that I I learned with this rec therapist it turned it into a little bit more and we had different ages. And so it works really well with mostly, I would say from teens to middle-aged there, there were a couple like outliers, but that was mostly who I worked. I was only, I would only volunteer there for a summer doing that. So I was, I wasn't there that long, but it was like a good game for that. Yeah. At cognitive level, I guess that was working on those physical things that they were trying to improve, like their visual scanning, motor planning, visual perception. Yeah, that's so interesting. I love that there's a concussion clinic out there that uses those table games to help with the treatment that they're providing for their clients. That's super cool. And then just thinking about like those people bringing those games home and having fun with their families, what do you think are some more like social emotional benefits of table games? Because I feel like that's a huge part of the board games when we use them therapeutically. Yeah, that's, I think that is usually the first thing that everyone, well, I can't say everyone, but the first thing that <laughs> me, like people will think of, especially people who are not recreation therapists, like the the supervisors and the coworkers that I've worked with, they're like, oh, I guess that's, I guess like you're doing a games group. Like, I guess that's social. Like, I guess that's good. And it it, it is. Like, like, it is. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it totally is. and some people are more enthusiastic about it than others I think maybe in part because games are something that people do for fun when they're not in therapy it's hard to like connect like this is therapy kind of thing for people that are not as familiar with recreation therapy I was really excited to find this quote that Cheek sent me high Nihali Cheek sent me high the the psychologist that founded flow theory that recreation therapists love, he said that games are an obvious source of flow, which flow is, you know, being able to be in an experience fully engaged and you're, you forget about time and you're laughing and it's huge for emotional benefits and games are just also great for those social benefits. So not only like this group, this TBI group saying, oh yeah, I'm going to take this game home and like play with my kids. Like that sounds fun. Mm -hmm. but also to create a community (laughs) that you are bonding experiences. We had soldiers in recovery at the soldier recovery unit that we both worked at. Yes, where we both worked, (laughs) where we became friends. (laughs) And one of the first, so we started doing games when I was very new to that position and we, we just did them in the barracks And the barracks in, so in this community, different, different military will have, you know, closer knit friendships with each other because they actually work together in our setting. They did not. Everyone that came to our setting was here for treatment. Right. And so they didn't know each other. They didn't come from the same unit. And often if they were staying in the barracks, it was because they didn't have family that was nearby and so there was a lot of isolation going on there was a lot of like feeling lonely on top of everything else 
going on with Especially them. Especially when 2020 started and then there was, so not only were they living alone, but now they can't go out and like be yeah. as social with people outside of their immediate area. Yeah, it was, yeah, that was, that was rough. <laughs> uh, so when we did this game group, it was easiest to get people from the barracks to come play because they're just right there. So they live there. Come was, downstairs. Yeah, we were like, hey, come downstairs, come and play. I taught them phase 10. And mm-hmm. I've played this game since I was a child. <laughs> and so to me, phase 10 is very similar to Uno in my mind, I guess. Like, mm-hmm. it, it's not like this, it, it's fun, but it's, it's not like earth shaking for me, I guess, but we played this game. And if you've played phase 10, it's hard to play it in an hour. So after the hour, we were like, okay, yeah, we're done. I don't usually play phase 10 with the intent that I'm going to finish all 10 phases, but it's not during group. <laughs> yeah, Right. Like not. Yeah. Maybe if I'm like uh, up with my family or something, but yeah, in a, in a one hour group, I don't expect that. So we were cleaning up and the soldiers wanted to keep playing. So they actually went to the store that was near the barracks on base. Someone mm-hmm. went to the store and bought a pack of phase 10 game, like the game phase 10. And then they told us the, so they told us the next weekend, like, oh yeah, we were up all night on Friday playing board games, like playing phase 10. <laughs> like they got so into it. And it was really cool because they didn't know each other. Like yeah. we, or like they they probably seen each other at formation or something but it created this whole community of soldiers that were in a very similar place just in that they were trying to recover they were like thrown out of their regular routine they weren't around their family but other than that like what was going to bring them together kind of thing and it it created this great community where they'd hang out all the time they'd come to our activities yeah. do their own activities it was really awesome yeah, I love when that happens. When Jana and I worked at the soldier recovery unit, it was so fun to see our soldiers like get together and become friends. Like you could almost watch relationships forming and they kind of are able to commiserate and like complain about the tough things that are going on in their lives with somebody who's actually going through it with them. But if they hadn't come to like games group or like another group, they probably would have just stayed alone in their room and had those thoughts to themselves. But now they're getting to like talk to people and then they share their stories. So I just love seeing that. And I feel like the games group was especially useful for forming those bonds. Yeah, I would sometimes feel like we were game matchmaker or like friend matchmakers. (laughs) Kind of, yeah. I mean, if you got nothing else out of our recreation therapy group, you came out and had a good time with people. You like got out of your room. You were happy for at least a little bit. (laughs) Why? You spent some time like doing stuff with other people. If you if you have a group where you want them to like work better together, I'm thinking about like the teens at the residential treatment center or, or yeah, yeah. You know, a situation where you're like, okay, I want you to form close bonds. Cooperative games can be really helpful. Um, so a cooperative game, I didn't know what a cooperative game was. I know we learned about cooperative games and I could probably like sort of give you an example but I don't know if I could like name a game (laughs) (laughs) so I've I've started playing them just in the last couple of years just with friends cooperative game is the the goal is it's all of you all of the players versus the game and so one game that we have is called the captain is dead dangerous planet and (laughs) yeah I know it's quite long so I said it's slow (laughs) so that if you guys want to look it up it is it is a lot of fun my my husband looked it up like best cooperative board games or something and that came up so we got it for Christmas so I've just just playing it with my friends was how I started and mm-hmm. it was so each person has a different role and this is this is quite common in these sort of cooperative games each person has a different role or superpower that you have so maybe this person can like skip a turn or this person, like just little things that make it easier for you guys to work together, but they're all different. And so you kind of look at what, oh, this person's really good at this. And so when you start planning your turn, you're planning it with everybody else in mind Mm -hmm. and working together. So it's not like a, okay, I'm going on my turn and I'm doing my thing, or at least it's not supposed to be, it's supposed to be interactive. And so there's, there's a lot of learning that takes place if you haven't ever done a cooperative game because it can take 
a little bit of time to figure out, oh, like I, like, this is not a game where I like hide my cards and like, don't tell anyone what I'm going to do. This is a game where we need to like think ahead together. So there's different tasks that you need to do in this particular game. We're trying to get artifacts. You're trying to uncover artifacts, but then there's these evil bugs that are trying to eat you. So the game gets quite involved but you're all working together to just kind of look ahead and be like, oh, like, I think you could do this on your turn because this would help. So it kind of adds that whole new level of social interaction where it's spending time, but you're like planning together. Yeah, you're forcing people that sometimes, I mean, I've definitely had groups before. I think back, like I did my internship at a residential treatment facility as well. Just having groups that aren't necessarily the most comfortable talking to each other but I could see where playing a game where like, you're almost forcing them to talk to each other and to practice all those social skills when they're having to figure out, okay, how am I gonna like overcome this challenge? It's almost like a challenge course, but in board game form. Yeah, it, actually it totally is, <laughs> yeah. Like you're trying to figure out like how to do this, but you don't have to have all of the materials for a board mm-hmm. game. Yeah, so which is nice. Cooperative Much safer too. have a lot of little pieces. <laughs> So, and they can be time consuming moving into like maybe times you wouldn't want to do a board game. So cooperative games, because like by design, they're, they're you against the game. They have to be a little bit more complicated than, and, and I'm sure that there are cooperative games that are not complicated, not as complicated. A lot of the ones I've played, like the captain is dead pandemic. Mm -hmm. You can get, have you seen those escape games in a box or escape room? in a box game yeah. it's like you go to the escape room but you don't have to go there you don't have to pay yeah. for it. it's like a board game yeah yeah and so you have like all of these clues so yeah they just they can be time consuming and there is a learning curve <laughs> like i was saying so oh, yeah. like we we set up pandemic at the residential treatment center and if I had all the time in the world then it could have been a really great experience but because we didn't uh, we kind of ended the the game. The The students had just kind of barely begun to understand the game, but they were still not doing super great at working together. Yeah. So there was a little bit of tension. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had to end. And that was, oh, that was the planning because if, because we had to go on to a next activity. So there wasn't as much time to process as what I would have liked. Mm-hmm. And it ended with people being, frustrated discouraged and so yeah. and that's not just with cooperative games right any game you kind of want to make sure that it you know the time limits on it yeah for sure I think like with that group they probably were not a group that you would want to just abruptly end the game in the middle of now some groups might be okay with that some people might be like yeah whatever I wasn't too invested in this game of Scrabble but I think when we're working with time constraints as rec therapists it's, it's important to think about like who we're playing with and what <laughs> tolerance level they have for just stopping abruptly. Also, if you kind of know the game that you're playing with, one thing you could do would be to plan out playing it in multiple sessions. So kind of like scaffold it. We're like, okay, guys, today we're just going to learn the rules, like the very basic rules. And then the next day, okay, now that we learned the rules, let's review them. And then let's like play a shortened game. And obviously some games take longer than others, like cooperative games are probably more of a time commitment than like Uno. (laughs) Yeah, but I think that's a great suggestion. And I think even in one of our research articles, they suggested that as well. Like it's best if you really want to get the full experience of the games, a lot of times it's better to play it in multiple times. And and I do that too, because my first time playing a game, I sometimes it's like, I I didn't really understand that until the end or that kind of thing. It's helpful to be able to do that. Especially with those more like involved strategic games, like Settlers of Catan or Ticket to Ride, if you don't have enough time to explain it and people haven't played it before, it does take a good amount of time before you're actually having fun. Because I've had games where I've played them with people and we never, like, we only just figured out how to play it as the session was ending. And then they had like a really bad, like almost a bad taste in their mouth from playing the game. So the next time when I was like, oh, we're going to play this game again, they were like, no, it was too hard. And it was like, well, you haven't given it a chance to like be enjoyable yet because we haven't gotten to the fun part. We're still in the rules part. So definitely something to consider if you have the time to take it. Yeah. 
build it into more sessions if possible if you're if your people are interested in it as well totally and sometimes it's hard because maybe they're not like as on board with the games in the first place yeah that's another thing we should talk about too so I know as rec therapists we have to explain ourselves a lot we have to like justify what we're doing have you ever encountered a situation where you've had pushback from like a supervisor or I guess working with the military with a commander who thought that table games was maybe not worth their time or maybe even like a client? Yeah, all of the above. And this this can be for any activity, but I think again, like there there's some there's some prior expectations of games. It could be that they they think it's fickle or really like you're just childish. Like they think it's a it's just an easy thing to do kind of thing like okay like you're just not trying hard enough and so they don't really think of it as therapy right and and I think that's where a lot of um the way we present it to them and the way we present the the results could not be just like everyone had a great time well I mean Mm -hmm. like that, that could be a part of it if that's what you're trying to do but try really hard to or I tried really hard to emphasize the therapeutic benefits that we were seeing. So telling them about, you know, this group that played games all night, if they were, you know, working on sleep, that might not have been the best thing. But talking about like, talking about the research about like, oh, like this, this is supposed to help decrease symptoms of a depression. We saw that with these clients. So really taking those those evaluations that you do after the fact and sharing with the supervisors, even if it's just a quick email I found Mm -hmm. or just like a quick thing because administrators, supervisors, they're, they're most of the time, what they're getting from people are complaints, right? Like everything is wrong with this, everything is bad with this. And so if they're a little iffy, but they're letting you do it afterwards, just sending them like a quick, maybe paragraph email at the most being like, Hey, like, I just wanted to let you know, like this client was at this game today. I saw them engaging in a way that I haven't seen them in any of the other groups. They were talking to this person and it seemed like a really great experience or, or things like that to just kind of talk about the positive things, especially in a therapeutic, use their language, right? Use the therapeutic language so that it's not just like, we had a lot of fun (laughs) because then you start getting labeled as just the fun guys and and the therapy people. And so when they're thinking about things to cut, they'll say, what was the, like, everything you do is fun. You don't have to do table games, right? Or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I feel like it's good for us to be able to justify the benefits of what we're doing. So that's like a really easy way to do it, just to email your people and say, hey, like this client I was working with had a really great day. And these are the the positive outcomes that I noticed. Um, Another thing I think of with not only supervisors not enjoying or like not seeing the benefit of table games, but also just the clients that we work with. I've done table game sessions with clients where they were like, this is a kid's game or like, why are we playing this game? So I guess, what, how do you think you'd approach that situation if you had a client that was like, this is like not worth my time? <laughs> Maybe they don't like board games. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And I think it was, it's interesting for me because in my family, we grew up playing board games. So to yeah. me, board games is not just a kid thing, but a lot of soldiers that I worked with board games was a thing that they, they had only played like, you know, Candyland, Shoots and Ladders, like it was yes. a thing for their kids. And so it is helpful, I think, to start with something familiar. So like, mm-hmm. like the Blackjack 21, or like card uh-huh. games, like adults play card games. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like starting with like, maybe those games that are a little bit more familiar, I think has been really helpful where like, just not like having like everyone gets to game group. It's their first time ever. They're maybe a little iffy about it. And you have the most complicated board game set up with all yeah. the little pieces. It can be quite overwhelming. And so I think starting small and I think you like, you did really great where when people would come into our group and they would be a little like, oh, I don't want to, you would just kind of talk to them about like, wh- why don't you just try it? Mm-hmm. Just kind of helping them like realize like your life is not going to end if you spend the next half. Yeah. Hour Cause I feel like most likely they'll like 
them play a game for a little bit if it's like phase 10 they'll be like well I've never played this game before and I'm like well that's okay why don't you try it and then like after they've kind of grasped the concept and then like had a little bit of chance to be competitive and like kind of get more into that flow state then they're like oh this is actually kind of fun and I actually enjoy it and I've actually I've had soldiers play phase 10 with us and be like okay I'm gonna go home and buy this like this is actually really fun I want to play this with my wife or I want to play this with my kids yeah I think Sometimes one thing that I like to think about too is that for people that think that board games are childish or like not worth their time, it's just to kind of it opens a door to having a conversation about their attitudes towards that type of recreation or even leisure in general. Like maybe they didn't grow up playing board games or maybe it's not something that was available to them. So to like kind of talk about what their attitudes are that are preventing them from wanting to play the game and like if there's anything we can do to work through that or if there's like another recreational activity that they're maybe more interested in that might be more beneficial just kind of like reframing that idea yeah <laughs> like especially you- like I love that you mentioned like if they haven't had experiences or if they had bad experiences if every time you tried to play Monopoly with your family board well, tablets, Monopoly. <laughs> which to be fair we don't blame anyone for playing board no board. no you can dislike the games that we have if every time you sat down to play a game it ended in frustration and or overwhelm then that's yeah. not like then like you said like kind of having that leisure education kind of helping them reframe like what this could be I think mm-hmm. it's important to realize like this is and and many of our activities but I think board games in particular might be one where people have had previous experience and didn't like it and so we're overcoming not just you know not just generalized stereotypes that they have but their own experiences of whether or not that was a positive experience yeah definitely I was just gonna say it depends on the population that you're working with too because like we're talking about having conversations about attitudes towards leisure and some of the populations you work with like for example some of my nursing home residents might not cognitively be in a place to like discuss their attitudes towards leisure you might just say okay like you don't want to play this game you think it's childish because you played this as a kid which is one thing that I did come across working in a nursing home where people would be like this is a kid's game and I'd be like that's fair let's find maybe a more age-appropriate game because in that case I didn't want them to feel like I was treating them like a child which is another Thing that happens in nursing homes with activities sometimes yeah so, definitely yeah another thing to consider <laughs> no I love that that's that's important to bring up I think too um the research really emphasized like emphasized that maybe it might be a little bit difficult to measure progress or measure outcomes mm-hmm. with it yeah so they might not like see it as worthwhile if you're just like we're gonna sit down and play a game for an hour and they're like great I had fun like cool what did that do for me (laughs) right and I think that that is a fair a fair thing right it's the difference between an activities manager or director and a recreation therapist is Mm -hmm. am I bringing out this game just to have fun which is a valid like I'm not saying that that's not a good thing okay but there's so much that we can add to that if we just do a little bit of assessing and a little bit of planning it can really turn it into a strong therapeutic experience where they can work on their goals. And that is, you know, really what I want for our clients is not just that they, that positive emotion is important. And a lot of times that is a goal, but that they're working on the goals that they, that I'm, that it's a re there's a reason they're here, right? There's a reason I'm working. Yeah. So being able to assess that, I think is. Yeah. It all goes back to API, right? Like us as recreational therapists are being intentional. We assessed our clients. And then that planning section is really important for us with all activities, but including board games where when you're sitting down to like plan this table game session with your client, you might consider what skills the game would actually be working on or like what skills you want to work on with the client. And then you can kind of pick a game that's most appropriate for that. Yeah. There was this article that we read that was published in 1993 where they systematically made a quantitative, a qualitative, and a transfer of training goals for a board game. Mm-hmm. So just as the, the article was really interesting. It was kind of about like, how would you use a board game for treatment? Yeah. So definitely recommend people to go look at our show notes for that because I, I put in their, their board game was like a 
one that they had just created. And so I did it, I, I kind of adapted their goals to the game of checkers because I thought that's one that a lot of people understand. But yeah, just a very simple, like quantitative, like the client will, you know, if you're working on that mobility, be able to pick up this piece so many times, qualitative, like they can work on, you know, they, they can work on. I was going to say like taking their turn or. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the person will wait to take their turn or the person will describe their their strategy to you after the game. Yeah. That can be a goal to talk about like how they're how they're using that. And then like the transfer of training, right? Yeah, like, oh, they took turns. Like they took turns here. We played this game three times. They got good at taking turns. And then we went to the library and they got good at taking turns waiting to yeah. put their book in the book thing. Yeah, yeah, I really like that article. I feel like it broke down writing goals for table games specifically in a way that was like really easy to understand. Cause I know in my experience as a recreational therapist, sometimes writing goals can be kind of tricky and you're like, what am I measuring? Especially when it's those more like qualitative things like emotional responses, it's hard to write. Like you can't write, oh, the client's gonna feel joy playing this game. You're like, <laughs> how do we measure that? So I liked that article. And I think that anyone considering using table games who might be struggling with planning their goals out, it would be useful to read the article and kind of get an idea of how other people have done it. Yeah. And this is a great way to, you know, uh, going back to the one above real quick, to just the, the, how we're talking about, like, sometimes people see it as fickle. If you present your supervisors with specific goals that are being worked on and then show them the specific progress, like that, that's the same as any sort of therapy. Right. And so that that will also help or even talking to the clients beforehand <laughs> like going back to like the game of purses like kind of setting up beforehand like kind of processing beforehand like this game is going to be a lot of like choices and consequences <laughs> and just so they yeah. are aware and following that too so that they can kind of be thinking about what they yeah. have to do about it afterwards You're briefing them before the game so they kind of have that therapeutic idea in mind as they're playing it so that yeah. later you can debrief them <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Love it. We are rec therapists. <laughs> hey, everybody. It's Carol. Thanks for listening to our episode today on table games. Join us in part two, where Jana and I discuss many of the adaptations that we've used for table games, as well as go through the API process for this modality. Can't wait. Bye.